Welcome to our second brown bag event from the League of Women Voters of Amherst Racial Justice Committee. Uh, we are really happy to be with you today. And um, the first thing I'd like to do is to introduce the folks who are in our committee. Not everyone could come. But we will, um, I'll, I'll just introduce Ash Hartwell is here, and uh, Martha Hanner is here, and Andrea Battle and Martha will be co chairing the committee for at least two, two plus months because I will be away. And um, we're all really happy to have you with us. Um, I wanted to start by just giving a little background information about how this came about. Our dear Susan Millinger had the idea after the reckoning uh, began after George Floyd's murder that our old committee of what was local action, which then turned into social action, but then kind of got a little slowed down for a while. And Susan had the wonderful idea of reinvigorating this uh, committee, but giving it a more precise um, focus of racial justice. And um, so we basically got started April, 2020. And our, uh, our I'm just going to talk about our goals. Um, we have a whole statement of goals and purpose, but I just want to get to the goals. Uh, so we have four basic goals. And, um, and by the way, we will be revisiting this actually tomorrow because our committee is having a three hour uh, internal kind of retreat. And one of the things we'll be doing is going over these goals. But the the first goal was to collaborate with individuals and community groups that are addressing racial injustice in Amherst. The second goal to explore involvement. At the time, it was just a proposed resident committee, but it did become the community safety working group. So to explore involvement with a community safety working group and how we could be of support to them. The third goal was to seek to diversify the membership of the, Amer the uh, Amherst League. And that is always a work in progress. And four, to create a communication stream in both the Amherst League and the local community about the racial justice and legislative efforts that are happening on the state level of the league. So this liaison between us as a local league and the state league, and then of course, the state and the national league is also another huge, you know, kind of um, bringing together. So that's why I'm so happy Amy Cooper is with us today from the state league. And, um, you know, that, that is encouraging in terms of one of those goals. Um, so let's see, as far as educating the league members, um, in the e-bulletin every month, I put a, uh, you know, what's going on and what we're working on, but also a list of resources. And we've been doing this now for several months. And I hope you all get to scroll down on that e-bulletin to where our little section is because there's some wonderful videos and books and um, documentaries, uh, all kinds of things that we have put in there that um, we encourage people to enjoy, but also do some self-education. Uh, so that's one thing I wanted to bring up. And the other thing is just that these brown bag programs we are hoping will serve that purpose too to help to educate the local league members and to just bring us more and more together and more kind of up to speed, not only about racial issues in general, but what is going on in Amherst. And there is a lot going on. It's really, you know, kind of a hopping uh, and vibrant 
um, part of the development of our town and, and the growing of our town. Um, okay, let's see. Another aspect of things we've been doing, two more things I wanna say really quickly. One, last Mar March, 2020, we had a panel <clears throat> and we invited a whole bunch, well, six groups who were working on racial justice issues to come and present. And the idea of that was to get everybody to be on the same screen with each other and hear from each other. And out of that came this idea of creating a network. And that is still a work in progress. But the idea is to help to dismantle the silos of all these different organizations and individuals working on issues in their own organizations, but not really knowing or collaborating or possibly you know, sharing resources and information with each other. So that network is still slowly, slowly developing. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to point out. And finally, this is something that Martha mentioned the other day to me, um, which is that we as a small committee, I think over the year and a half, we have been establishing some credibility with town government, with other organizations working on racial justice in Amherst, and um, just really kind of being some a, an, an, an in entity that is building trust. And, um, and that, that feels really important and takes time and effort and feels like something that is really happening. So uh, the next part of our agenda is to talk about the different um, memos that we've created and Ash is taking the floor next. Okay. <laughs> I, um, I don't have such a good memory as, <laughs> as Marcy, so I'm gonna share the screen a little just to, uh, just to show um, what, those, what, those, um, what those are, just a moment. Um, and and, <clears throat> and I'll speak to the, the the research paper on the indicators of racial equity and justice for Amherst because although it was it was done uh, last year uh, back in October actually. Um, it, it's still very, very relevant. And there's activity going on that is related to it. And basically what we asked is, what is the public information for Amherst Town that tells us what the, what the equity and justice situation is? What is the data that actually helps to inform that and can form the basis for ultimately a strategic plan? In other words, instead of thinking of the various activities of, of safety, um, of, of equity for housing, of equity for health, of equity for education, separately thinking of them of together and what do we know about that? And what we found was that it was very difficult to get information publicly available that told us, even representation in town governance, in terms of the participation of um, Black and um, immigrant and, and, and people of color. So um, we, we decided to do, Martha helped a lot and others to, uh, to do a survey. And we looked at about diff 16 different sources and we found that indeed there was very little that we could actually hold on to that told us a lot about these things. So we made some recommendations about how we could move forward and noted that above all that um, that the whole purpose of this is to um, lay the basis for what could be a strategic plan on dealing with racial equity and justice. In other words, um, to, we need that data as a basis for looking at how a town policy commitment for a strategic plan, programs, actions, and resources um, uh, could be accountable as it moved forward. And um, we drew a lot on the uh, on, on um, national sources for, for that kind of um, insight and, and, and framework. 
Um, as a consequence, there have been some initiatives um, taken. The, uh, the reparations for Amherst has done a good historical um, look and has drawn on some of our data. And currently the, um, the uh, <clears throat> African, we'll talk about this in a moment, but uh, the African um, Heritage um, Reparations Assembly, which has now been established, is uh, undertaking in, in, um, in cooperation with a group to do a census of um, African-American residents. And that's really important because we simply don't have um, the kind of data that would be needed to support the development of a strategic plan. So let me stop there. Uh, we wanted to say that it really is important that that kind of information continue. It, the report is just, just the beginning. And I'm gonna turn over to Martha who with Meg Gage, who isn't with us today, but uh, did a lot of work on the, um, another research paper on building a more diverse Amherst town government. Martha? Yes, all right, thank you, Ash. I, I must say the report, Ash did a tremendous amount of work on that report. We really did a lot of research as to what was available. From my side, I can say it took a lot of chocolate ice cream to get that report written. <laughs> But, but then we went on uh, and in the spring, we worked together on a report called Building a More Diverse Amherst Town Government. One important aspect of making Amherst an inclusive and welcoming community is the diversity that we have in our town staff and on the various boards and committees that help determine policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we put together this report with our recommendations to how to increase diversity and indeed a recipe that has been successfully employed in nonprofit organizations. So we described a three part overall strategy. First, uh, one needs outreach that is self perpetual and ongoing, i.e. not just when a job opening occurs. Uh, next, one needs a robust outreach database that can be used to recruit diverse candidates. Uh, again, not just when a job opening occurs, but ongoing. And third, and very important, one needs a strong supportive organizational culture where all members feel valued and where leadership encourages staff and committees to welcome diverse viewpoints. And we noted that people of color here in Amherst often don't feel welcome to serve on committees or apply for jobs. They feel that they're undervalued or their views are not respected. And if they do join a committee, uh, they often get discouraged and uh, drop out because of this. So we shouldn't launch a plan to build diversity if we're not prepared to value diverse opinions from people with differing life experiences. It can often be challenging to do so, but I'll uh, give a quote from George Patton, who said, if everyone is thinking alike, then someone isn't thinking. So we need a variety of viewpoints if we're going to move our uh, town forward. So first staffing, uh, we offered three guidelines, again, that were successful in uh, nonprofit organizations. First, ensure that each job opening is widely advertised. Uh, second, commit not to proceed with hiring until the pool of qualified candidates includes some set number of people of color. And this is really the key. You need to have qualified candidates, not just applicants, but people that you can take seriously. And you need to have a, a, a broad uh, group from which you can uh, choose and you know, various people you can interview and look at their strengths and weaknesses that bring some differing viewpoints. And then third, when there are two equally qualified candidates, then commit to hiring the person who brings the most diversity. So we have met with Paul Bockelman uh, on several occasions and diversity coordinator, uh, Jennifer Moyston and Jen has been developing just such a database and she's been conducting workshops with current staff to, to help uh, increase the understanding and to change the culture and try to make it more welcoming. Uh, so that is ongoing. Uh, we'll continue our dialogue uh, with them. 
but turning then to the boards and committees, this is equally important and indeed more challenging. Um, it's more challenging because it's all volunteers, right? And people who uh, don't really have high financial resources, who are working full time, who are raising children and so on. It's really challenging uh, to find the time uh, and to pay for childcare and uh, make the commitment uh, to serve on a committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so some of our proposed ideas here are we need to have say an outreach team. Uh, we need to make the application process on the town website somewhat more simplified. Right now it's a rather daunting uh, procedure. Uh, uh, we need to get creative of how we publicize openings and uh, do community outreach and try to draw people in. Uh, perhaps have internships so that uh, people could learn what a particular committee does and then decide whether it's something they want to be more involved in. Uh, and perhaps also consider um, resources, perhaps having some funding available for child care support so a person could attend meetings. Um, so uh, this is certainly uh, a project we intend to continue working on during the coming year. And perhaps we can have a brown bag after the holidays specifically devoted this topic where we can um, enlist your support and your ideas and uh, try to move forward. Thank you. So Andrea, you're on next and you need to unmute. Yeah. Yes, um, brown bag. And that comes from the brown bag lunch concept, except we're not brown bag lunching, but we're trying to get the same kind of things. Some issues that deal with diversity, inclusion, and equity um, in the town and from other people from without of outside to help us in just different ways of doing it. Um, we did have Jennifer who gave a really wonderful brown bag um, luncheon thing this summer or at the end of the summer. And it was really interesting. We learned an awful lot about the town. Um, and we are looking forward to um, possibly uh, getting the CSWG, the Committee Service Working Group, to come on and talk specifically a little more about what their suggestion and what, what things that they uh, did to develop and just to have people be able to question them in a much more comfortable environment where it's not the whole town you know, there, although we'd like to have a lot of people uh, to be there. Um, also, uh, Doreen Cunningham, who's in charge of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Amherst schools is coming in uh, December uh, to talk about that and what's happening in terms of the Amherst public schools. And um, we're, we're hoping to get uh, the African-American Heritage uh, Reparations Assembly people to come um, to talk about what their work is and something we're trying to to, to find different ways of learning about the community and what's, what's going on in relation to that. We also have a health uh, consultant, Barbara Person with, is supposed to be coming. We are trying to coordinate that also. I'm not sure that's gonna happen this year, if, but not if, if it doesn't happen sometime in November, it probably will happen in January uh, if she's available. And we're also looking at various other things um, that we can use. Um, and we certainly do uh, hope that people in the league can make some suggestions of either things that they've seen or the things they would like to see happen. We do have some ideas, but we haven't really, um, we're probably gonna talk about more of them at the um, uh, retreat tomorrow. So that's the end of mine. Re Rebecca Fricky and I are both working on that and we are trying to make it as um, comprehensive and understanding so that people can come and, and actually ask questions and get information in this community so that we will be more educated and more aware. And that's our objective. Marcy. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, you'll, you can keep uh, posted about our brown bag programs in the e-bulletin. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So before we move into the next part of the program, which is more focused on the work of the Community Safety Working Group, does anybody have any questions or comments at, for this part of the program that's more focused on the work of our committee more specifically? Um, please feel free to shout out and un unmute yourself. Uh, okay, I don't see anything. Okay, so Ash is going to take it from here and talk about um, the work of the CSWG. And I'm really sorry that Russ Vernon Jones had to leave because he is on the CSWG. And just a little FYI, um, next month we are really hoping to get them to come they will then not be a formal town committee anymore so they won't have the uh uh what's that word the limitations of open meeting law etc and um we want to hear more about their work specifically and their proposals so we anyway i'll let ash explain it but this is just an overview of what they're doing with a certain purpose in mind of why we're sharing it this month but please come back when we do another full uh in-depth dive into their work go ahead ash okay right um <clears throat> it's this we move now from you know as, as marcy said from looking at what the league's racial justice committee has been doing and look at the town initiatives generally um, going forward on racial justice and equity. And uh, largely this is the work of the community safety working group and their research, their dialogues, their reaching out to community of, um, to communities of color and, and also their, their extensive reports and really the most important thing we can say today is uh, join the town council's meeting on Monday. And the first major item on their agenda is the, rep, uh, is the presentation of the community safety working group on their second report and their final report um, on the establishment of a follow on group called the community safety and social justice committee, which is gonna pick up the work of the uh, of the community safety working group, but looking at it in terms particularly of implementation and advising uh, the way forward. It's also um, going to um, present their extensive work on uh, the resident oversight board. And I'll say a few more words about each of those in a moment. But I first wanted to say, hmm, I wish, <laughs> we really wish <laughs> that the Community Safety Working Group could make this presentation, but they are very busy getting ready for Monday and they weren't available to do it. They would have loved to, but, um, and, and so they said, please go ahead. And so I'm, I'm doing this kind of on their behalf um, with, with kind of humility. I, I, I just, um, but we're gonna actually use their words and their work. And we want to honor that work um, as has been noted um, in, in their reports and, and others that they've been working for almost 11 months now, um, meeting every week for one to two hours and a lot of background work and consultants and outreach and report writing. They have put in an enormous amount of work and, and effort and the quality of their work is, is really commendable. Indeed, it, it could be seen as a model for other communities of the Amherst type to, to take a look at. This isn't to say that it's been easy. It hasn't. It's been very difficult. It's been very, and it continues to be. And they want above all for us to send the message of, they need a lot of community support. This isn't something just done by a committee. It has to be done by the town. And they, and they ask for that. And I'm just gonna read a quote from their second report. And that is that, although the end of our charge is near, we urge community leaders to view the departments and funding that benefit the BIPOC community in larger terms beyond, okay, check this off, or um, oh, we're doing this initiative. 
we have we ask that the community understand that the issues that currently and historically plague the black <coughs> and indigenous uh, people of colors community and Amherst is a draw is a dynamic and growing diverse community and the our our working group was able to gather data hold community forums and put together reports that spoke to a narrative that the BIPOC community in Amherst knows better than those in the most powerful seats in town about what they need. And uh, I, I think this is a very important message. And I, it also comes with the, with, with the message in their second report that we know every Amherst resident reading this report, and it's a big report, um, loves Amherst. Um, if, you, if you do not love it here, you see this town for all it can be. And if you do not love this town here and you see this town for all it can be, let's amplify the recommendations that we've put forth to ensure the safety and well being of our entire community, and in particularly the Black and Indigenous people and people of color's community. Amherst has a com history of white supremacy that we cannot ignore. We really must move the community forward by letting the BIPOC voices guide our work to issues they know and have experienced in town to make Amherst the Amherst we all want it to be. I, I think it's very important to understand that this vision of that committee isn't just then about safety. It's really a much larger, a cultural, political, social change. And um, so <clears throat> in particular, the they, they have done an, really an enormous amount of work. And those of you who read the Indy can see a very nice summary of their work in the Indy that came out today. But they note that in the first report, the community responders for equity um, and, and um, safety um, have, um, was, was, a, was a major part of their first report. The establishment of a new department of diversity, equity, inclusion, a youth center and a community center, all were part of their first report. And uh, in the second report, the establishment of the new um, Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, which is a follow on from their work, um, will, will begin as well as the um, recommendations about the Resident Oversight Board. Um, and I wanted just to, uh, highlight the resident oversight board um, because it's going to be something that there's going to be a lot of well, discussion and, and, and there has been and um, it will be presented on Monday as I say but I, I just want to emphasize that what it, a lot of work has gone into this a lot of research and and hard thinking uh, in consultation with the um, police department and with other key actors in town and it, it its articulation of the mission is important, that it should be to provide accountability and consultation so that equitable and effective public safety services are provided by the Amherst Police Department, and that these services are provided in such a way that contributes to eliminating systemic racism and white domination in Amherst. And uh, the, uh, so I, I, you, you can actually, um, by reading the Indy report, by going on the town um, government site, um, you can actually get the full report um, and you can hear it at the town council meeting uh, tomorrow um, because it, it's got a lot of detail and a lot of uh, very important information. So I'm gonna move on to what was, now, what is now being implemented, and that is the community responders for equity, safety, and service. And basically, this is an alternative way for calls that usually have gone to 911 to be addressed um, by, a, by another channel. And that's a channel that offers um, uh, 
a, a not armed police response, but for mental health, for issues of, um, for issues of, 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 of domestic uh, issues that people need help with, there's a, there's a place they can call and get help. And the, uh, the <clears throat> it, it also is hoping to offer preventive services that get at the root um, so that residents uh, uh, avoid the necessity of police response. In other words, it's preventive rather than just responding to an emergency. And um, their work right now is, is being um, worked on with an implementation committee, which includes representatives from the Community Safety Working Group, the, the, the two co-chairs and the police department and the town manager is um, is managing that, um, and 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 they're working very hard. They're, they're faced with a problem that they're under budgeted in relation to the full recommendation, and there's a lot of pushback about that because um, for this to work, it takes a lot of support financially and also an understanding of what they're what they're trying to accomplish, what we're all trying to accomplish. And, and that's gonna relate also to the relationship to the Amherst Police Department and to the way the responder system is set up so that it is effective and, and it works. We can't afford for this not to work. Um, and they have a tight time frame. It's uh, intended to start up by February next year. And the recruitment, appointment and training of staff is all a big challenge at this point. Um, so again, they've had a lot of help from consultants groups and, and they've done a lot of, there's, there's a lot of work going on about this and we'll hear about some of that also at the meeting tomorrow. So let me stop here for a moment because, um, <clears throat> and I'm going, to, I'm going to close the screen so that we can see each other. <laughs> and, um, and just open it up for some questions and discussion. I want to be clear that we're probably not going to be able to give answers to the questions at this point because some of those will be on the agenda for tomorrow night and some of those we can delve into um, when we have the Community Safety Working Group members um, present next month. So we don't want to assume um, any answers, but we think that it's important to get the questions out there and to reflect a bit about, um, about all this work. And so the floor is open really for those who'd like to say, what about this and what about that? <laughs> And just to comment that the meeting is Monday night. Um, Ash keeps referring to next tomorrow night. And in my mind, the weekend is also truncated, but it's Monday night is the meeting at 630. And I put into the chat the link for the Zoom and also a link to the Indie article, which um, gives a lot of information. And um, it also has a, a, a whole bunch of links in there as well. So you can look into the chat for that. Thanks for that. Yeah, good, Marcy. In one sense, it's difficult because in fact, the volume of material and the details, um, and really it's always said the de devil is in the details. Well, there are a lot of details. Uh, none of this works uh, with just broad statements. It takes hard work and 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 uh, and, and a lot of a lot of effort. And uh, so, I'm sure you have questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> And by the way, Martha, Andrea, Marcy, you guys can ask questions too. 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny. I'm thinking it's very unleague like of us to not have our own set of prompt que prompting questions just in case nobody in the audience is asking a question. The wonderful candidates forums that have just been going on this whole month, um, you know, had that as a backup plan. If nobody had questions in the audience, we, we had questions in advance. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, a question, or I'll, I'll get started, is, you know, part of, I think, what looking back in hindsight, what was difficult was that the community safety working groups proposals were presented simultaneous to the budget process. So there wasn't an opportunity to look at the proposals and say, are these things our town wants to commit to without it being attached to money? And it made it very complicated. And then going down the money path asked for all kinds of details and specifics that took almost away from the fundamental question of, is there not just support, but a commitment to really authentic and sincere shifting in institutions in Amherst. And so that is something I hope that the new council can talk about is like, do we have a commitment to moving away from institutional structural racism that is embedded in this town without anybody's ill will necessarily, but that's embedded in the institutions, how can we how can we move into a, a new way of doing things and have that have that um, that sincerity or that commitment and then figure out the budgeting, you know, to separate them? Yeah, and and one thing I would add is that already the budget for the next fiscal year is being developed. And, and Lynn, maybe you can answer this. Does the preliminary budget get presented to the town council in January? Am I correct about that or? Uh, uh, no, let me give you. Uh, uh, so no, we begin okay. the budget process on the 15th of November when the town manager presents and the uh, director of finance present what we call the financial indicators. It's the first look at what we think and are projecting our revenues are, as well as our known expenses. And um, it's usually at that point that the town manager will say, you know, everybody needs to be flat budgeted or whatever. That same night after the presentation of the indicators, there'll be a budget forum, which is a time for people to step forward and say, here's what we'd like to see in the budget. Um, at that point, uh, after right after that, within literally days, the finance committee starts drafting a set of financial guidelines. And those guidelines include um, things that the council would like to see in the budget. And those guidelines will come to the council, probably be discussed on December 6th, and definitely have to be adopted by the 20th. Now, that doesn't say amount of money it says money for this kind of thing okay and then um you know the budget process continues meantime we start meeting with uh the four towns because of the regional school budget is on a different cycle that actually begins as early as the beginning of december um january 3rd we swear in a new council and um the actual presentation of the town manager's proposed budget actually does not happen till May, May 1st. <clears throat> and at that point, the finance committee goes into high gear and we spend, uh, usually I've been on finance committee since I was joined the council. Um, we usually spend two days, two afternoons each week for three or four weeks until we review every part of the budget and do what we can to it. Um, and it was during that time last year that we increased the proposed number of community safety working uh, 
community safety responders, I want to get the right word, uh, from four to eight. And um, so that was an amendment that we made to the budget. Some people were very um, nudgy about that because it wasn't clear where that money would come from. Um, I've spent a lot of time in my career knowing municipal and other budgets and it, the money's there uh, because it comes from things like unfilled positions for periods of time. And uh, um, in addition to that, the, the town has applied for a state grant. Um, and I think we'll be hearing some news about that very soon. Um, that would also help fund the CREST program. So, um, but the budget process itself, the charter requires that we adopt a budget by the end of June. So really the months of May and June is when we get into the intense look, but a lot of the casting of where is that budget gonna go starts on November 15th. Yeah, so really that's what needs to be publicized then is that already November 15th, um, people right. need to be thinking about what the priorities should be. Right, right. yes, that's exactly. Okay. And it's one of the reasons why it's important that uh, the good news is this time the community safety working group will be is has come forward with their final report before the budget process starts instead of in the middle or at the end of it. Uh -huh. So exactly. it uh, gives us an opportunity to um, be able to fund whatever we can that's recommended there. Um, so we're, yeah. uh, it, it, it's an outstanding report. The group has done a phenomenal job. Yes, I mean, and the report is now available on the town. It is, it's right. available in yeah. the packet for the uh, council meeting on Monday. Okay. And it's also uh, available in the link to the Indy that, uh, that Marcy yes. gave. Uh, okay. I wanted to say that <clears throat> um, the, the, the really phenomenal work and research that has gone into this is, and it has led to a whole series of beginning, just the beginning of structural changes in the town and its organization. And for one, I don't believe that the town can fail on this. It just must succeed in moving forward. And I say that because from the black and um, indigenous and people of color community, there's a great deal of skepticism. They see these as potential steps, but, but there's also the feeling that, is the town really behind this? Are people really gonna support it? Because it was pretty horrendous that the first, the first response to the proposal for the communities, um, the CREST program um, was, <clears throat> was a very paltry budget. That, that, and that had to do <laughs> with the fact that the town manager had a short time to say, here's what we can do. And, and, and it, so it, it revolved, as Marcy said, around a budget question rather than around the fundamental process that was being proposed. And we now have some time well, not a lot, but we have some time to, as a town, as a community, to mobilize and gather support. And, and this is why we're really asking, participate in the meeting tomorrow night. Become informed and engaged because it's going to be very important for the town. So the question is, how do we support this as a community? How do we, how do we achieve a unity and a, and a vision and of, of implementation? And I would also like to know on a kind of separate but related topic, now that the Amherst Bulletin is not distributed to all households, what are the main ways that people in our community learn about what's going on or learn what's important and what's coming up? If you're not, you know, addicted to going to the town website all the time and following things, um, how do you know about things? Uh, is there something different we should all be doing uh, to help with communication? I'd be happy to have, you know, other people than our than our committee members uh, answer what they think here. Anyone have thoughts? 
Where do you get your information from? <laughs> yeah. It's so interesting. I'm, I'm just going to jump in. I, I would love to hear people's answers, but it's so interesting because in my mind, and this is like um, a, a reaction to the nation as a whole, by saying who, what, which, where you get your information, by default, it's kind of outing you <laughs> to what your opinions, what your frame of reference, what side, what hack, what, you know, I mean, they're so, it, it, they're, it, they're, it's so polarized, even in our town, it's so polarized that by saying, oh, I read the Indy or I read the Amherst Current, you're making a big statement that's kind of a political statement. And that I find so unfortunate. And um, when I first moved to Amherst in 1987, 88, like the bulletin, there were, there were reporters going to solid waste committee and a planning board and all even little, little um, committees like solid waste or big committees like school or planning or, and we could read about it in the bulletin. And it also had a bias, of course, there's nothing that's not biased, but it didn't have the political charge that these places have now. So if you don't want to say what, where you get your news, I totally understand because <laughs> it, it has some implication, but it, it is in itself evidence of a problem in our town that we can't, we, you know, unless you read all of them, and that takes a lot of time. <laughs> hey, Di Diana, look, you got a thought? Yes, I do. Um, back, uh, the newspaper, the bulletin, used to report on what happened at town meeting in more detail than we are getting in the bulletin for what the council is doing. And that's unfortunate because it's a way to get more people in town aware and part of the process. So I'm, I'm sorry. And we used to also have a town meeting listserv where people had discussions. Um, and that too, there's no equivalent in our, um, in our process right now. So I, I think people feel more distant to what's going on than they used to. Yeah, I think too, there's a change of the Gazette policy that if you receive the Gazette, you no longer get the, uh, um, the Amherst Bulletin. Right. And the Amherst yeah. Bulletin often summarized things that were in the Gazette rather than... So, so oh, I, get, I get both. Don't you, you get do? both? You're special. Uh, no, I, oh. <laughs> I get, I definitely get both weekly, so I don't know. Oh. Yeah. It might be that you get the Gazette and you also signed up for the bulletin, but the bulletin is no longer added in as a supplement of the Gazette. Oh, that, that's probably the case that I, you know, where it said, do you want to receive the bulletin? Exactly. I said, yes. Oh. Okay, well, I guess I must have missed out on that then. <laughs> but again, the bulletin doesn't do yeah. a very good, thorough job. And without, right. without like weighing in on one bias or another, I do recommend the Indy for their reporting. Now, you know, you can forget about the opinion pieces if you don't wanna go down that road, but their reporting on meetings is quite thorough and they put in a lot of links for the the uh, you know the video recording or any documents that are attached to the meeting i i find them very helpful and you can look at this in the um report about the meeting that's coming up as an example of that full of links to uh documents and reports that are going to be relevant. Mm -hmm. Cynthia? Oh, you're muted, Cynthia. She's trying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can see she's... 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was the other? I didn't. I don't know the other um, media thing that you talked about. M or something else. Current. Oh, okay. I've never heard of that. So, okay. Uh, and there might even be. I know. Is that the one that's Nick's Nick Grabe's blog? Is the Amherst Current? Mm -hmm. um, and now that we have two PACs in town, I don't know if the PACs have their own list serves and if they're doing a version of what Diana was talking about when town meeting had a list serve. That was very internal for town meeting members. It wasn't for people at large, you know, just residents. But I, I don't know if PACs are having their own uh, way of disseminating information. But the Amherst Current and the Amherst Indy are the two that I'm aware of. Um, as we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour, and I did want to mention that another um, decision that was made from the town council and, and has been established is the um, African um, Heritage Reparations Assembly, which is charged with doing the research and looking at the potential financing sources for a plan of, of reparations. Um, and and they, um, they have been appointed and just started to meet, but they, they, they're, they're in process at this point. But it is, a, it is a committee that is charged to really do the research and to think um, by looking nationally and, 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 and deeply into the questions which are very problematic and very difficult um, about reparations. And so that's in place. And I, just and I I'd love to add um, I would love to add that we're we're all league people here, <laughs> and uh, although we do have program advocacy for our, the racial justice work, we do not have um, yet, as far as we know locally, any study group on reparations per se. We are looking into the idea of whether there is a, on the state or national league level, if there's any kind of uh, advocacy program about reparations, but that is something that um, we're looking into and it'll be interesting. It's such a big topic nationally. I would be surprised if it didn't become a topic nationally for the league and uh, and if how is how is it possible for our Amherst League to move forward on these big questions? Should there become some internal study as well, or what what is going on? So we're looking into that, and uh, to be continued about the reparations question. But our brown bags are more about education than anything else. And um, we, we urge you to go to the meeting on Monday, for instance, um, to, you know, get educated and to possibly do some advocacy on behalf of CSWG. But generally, just so you know, these meetings, we are not endorsing anything at this point. We are really here to educate you about the issues and hear from you. Um, and if you have, we are coming to an end, but oh, we have a few more minutes. But I also just want to say, please let us know what you'd like us to do for programming on these brown bags. We, you know, we're, we're open book and we, we want to hear from you. And we also want to respond to the needs of, of, our, of our league. So please, please feel free to stay in touch.